come today to the conclusion of our series on the great ecumenical creeds. So far, we've looked at the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Constantinople, and today we take a look at the creed that arose from the Council at Chalcedon. Sometimes this is called the Chalcedonian definition. The reason that particular language is used is because it defines the two natures of Jesus, his full humanity and his full deity. Now, let me tell you right off the bat that this is one of the longer and more complex of the creeds. In fact, we used this recently in the church where I serve, and I had folks say to me afterwards, uh, wow, that was a, a really long creed, and I didn't understand much after the first sentence or so. So it's really long and it's really complicated, but it's worth taking the time to take a look at, even if it's not one of the ones that we use most frequently in the church. As I said, the issue is the two natures of Christ, his full humanity and his full deity. Now recognize that there were at least four positions that the early church could have taken with regard to the nature of Jesus. And in fact, there were people in the early church period who held each one of these positions. Some of the different heresies are named after people who held different ones of these positions. They could have said that Jesus was simply fully human. He was a human being empowered by God to do this particular work, namely to model for us the life that pleases God, to die on the cross, and so forth. They could have held that Jesus was fully God, and that's all, that somehow he appeared to be human, but wasn't really human. That was a position the church could have taken. Both of those were relatively simple and straightforward. It didn't involve any mixing of two natures together. The third position that they could have been taken was that this was somehow a hybrid combination of humanity on the one hand and divinity on the other hand, and there were those who held that position. The most complex of the positions, though, was the one that the church finally believed, uh, came to conclude was the orthodox position, and that is that somehow in Jesus of Nazareth you have fully present 100 percent human nature and a fully present 100 percent divine nature. Mixed, not mixed, joined together, but in a way that they're not confused so that you have yet a third thing. Why did the church believe that? Again, it was the question of human salvation. They believed that only God could do what it was needed to save humanity, and so in Jesus there had to be a full divine nature. They also believed that if humanity were going to be saved, it had to be through hu a human person. And so there had to be a human nature combined with this divine nature. Let's take a look now at the Creed of Chalcedon and see how it is that the church affirmed the two natures of Jesus. Now, as I've said, this creed is not going to have much about the Father or the Holy Spirit. This is focused fully on the question of the nature of Jesus, and so you could call it a Christological creed in that sense. We then, following the Holy Fathers, and here of course they mean the Fathers of the Church, we then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach people to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The same, perfect in Godhead and also in manhood. Truly God and truly human of a reasonable or rational soul and body, co-essential with the Father according to the Godhead, and co-essential with us according to his humanity, in all things likened to us except without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood or humanity. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures by no means being taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved, and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. So you can see 
from the language that's used here, the level of complexity and the, the issues that they're trying to deal with. But notice in particular about uh, not quite two-thirds, a little more than half of the way down, there's this sentence where they seek to uh, deny some of the common positions that the church came to believe were heretical or, or uh, incorrect. They said that uh, Jesus was to be uh, confirm, affirmed, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, and then it goes on to say inconfusedly, that is the two natures aren't mixed together, unchangeably, that is they're not you know, some um, combination, indivisibly, they're joined together in a way that can't be taken apart, inseparably. All right, see, they're given a lot of attention here to being really, really careful about how they say this because they think a lot hinges on it. Notice also that they say that Jesus does this, the Son does this for us and for our salvation. They take the time to say that this is not two persons in one body. You don't have Jesus and the eternal Son, two separate people somehow joined together in one body, but rather two natures in one person. The church had a word that it used to describe the, the union of divine and human in Jesus. They called it the hypostatic union. This is just another one of those uh, Greek terms that ends up getting used as a uh, pointer, if you will. It, it's essentially a way, a way of saying we can't describe how the human and the divine are combined in this one person, Jesus of Nazareth. But we're going to use the word hypostatic to name it. They can name it, but they can't describe it. So, in the course of our series on the Great Ecumenical Creeds, we started with the Apostles' Creed, 12 short affirmations about the Christian life of faith. And then we moved to the Nicene Creed, the creed that arose out of the Council of Nicaea, where the question was, who is this Jesus? And the answer was, he's human and he's God. And then we moved to the Creed of Constantinople, because in the Apostles' Creed and in the Nicene Creed, the Holy Spirit got relatively little attention. And so with the Creed of Constantinople, we get an affirmation of the full divinity of the Holy Spirit as well. And we pretty much have settled the basic contours of the Trinitarian doctrine. And then today with Chalcedon, we get back to a little more detail on what exactly it means to say that Jesus is fully God and fully man. By that we mean to affirm that there's two natures in one person. And all of this is meant to help us understand the great work that God's engaged in in restoring right relationship between himself and humanity. Now let it be the case from this point forward when you stand to affirm one of these creeds in your church, don't let it just be a rote recitation of the words, but let it sink in what struggles the church went through to find these very short, succinct statements of faith so that you and I, to go back to using the words of Rich Mullins, so what we believe can make us who we are as followers of Jesus. Jesus.